Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte. Episode 38, recorded January 25th, 2012. Clay A. Johnson. Triangulation is brought to you by Ford, featuring voice-activated Sync App Link. Now you can control select smartphone apps with your voice, so you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Fiesta and at Ford.com slash technology. 80% of Americans suffer from information obesity, says Baratunde Thurston. My brain's fat. <laughs> So it's time to go on the information diet. Here we are on Triangulation, Leo Laporte with Tom Merritt. We always love to do this show on a Wednesday afternoon because it's time to sit down with somebody smart. Got a great one today. And uh, there's no one smarter about uh, information than Clay Johnson. I, we've never done a diet book before. Clay, welcome to Triangulation. It's funny. The first uh, the first cover of that book, uh, the the first concept cover of this book was a laptop with a donut on the screen, <laughs> and I sort of flipped out because I was like, "No one makes a diet book with a donut on the cover. No That's one will true. buy that diet book." That's right. Um, Clay's all, there's no food on the cover of diet books. Clay's done an interesting thing with the cover here. This actually has it's uh, the nutritional. Uh, it's the FDA label for information nutrition, and it's accurate. Right. He actually he actually made the tr took the time to say, well, there's fifty two thousand eight hundred twenty seven words. It take you two hundred sixty seven seven minutes to read. It's seventy four percent of your daily recommended intake. Nine percent history. Eighteen percent anecdotes. Only two percent. You'll be glad to hear this. Notes and citations. Only two percent. So also, is that if you add up the numbers on the bottom, it's a hundred percent biased. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> well, but, but of three different kinds, ideological, professional, and experiential. <laughs> so Clay, actually, when you talk about experience, uh, has quite a bit. He founded a, a website that you might know called Blue State, or actually a firm, not a website, called Blue State Digital, uh, that ended up uh, uh, building and managing Barack Obama's online presence during the 20, uh, 2008 campaign. Uh, and then uh, he s went to the Sunlight uh, Labs at the Sunlight Foundation, which is a really great organization designed to shed light on uh, governmental procedure and operations. Uh, it says here, uh, this is stunning, you built an army of 2,000 developers and designers to create open source tools to give people greater access to government data. That's amazing. Won the Google O'Reilly Open Source Organizer of the Year Award in 2009. He left the Sunlight Foundation last year to, uh, he left, I say you, because you know this. He left, for those of you who don't know this, the Sunlight Foundation to write this book. Welcome, Clay Johnson. It's good to have you. It's great to be here. Uh, this book is so hot, so fresh, that it lists Clay's Google Plus address. Wow. <laughs> in, the, in the back. So that's how. That's O'Reilly for you. That's how hip that's he good. is. What's the, what do, you, what, what do you mean, are you saying we get too much information? No, no, I'm saying that, uh, you know, you can't have too much broccoli, right? You don't find people that are, you know, uh, obese because they've, they're eating too much broccoli. And I think the same thing is with information. A healthy information diet isn't really about consuming less. It's about uh, consuming more of the good stuff and eating less of the bad healthy. stuff. Okay. Right. And I, what I like about this metaphor that you've hit on is it, it definitely follows the tradition of diet, right? For a long time, we didn't have enough food. There was a problem that people didn't get enough food. So it was always about how do we get right. enough to eat? And then we got to the modern age where suddenly we had too much food. And, in, and at least in the developed world, we did. We had to learn how to control eating too much. And it was a problem humanity had never had to face. Humanity's struggle had always been how to get the food. Now we didn't have that. Same with information. It's always been, I don't have enough information. How do I gather information? And then suddenly the computer era hits, the digital era hits, and we're awash in it. And, we, and now we have to figure out, well, okay, not all this information is good for us. So, Clay, if you can walk us through, like, what kinds of information are out there that we should avoid? You know, what's what's the landscape there? What are the donuts and what are the broccoli? How do we <laughs> I tell? Mean, the, you know, that's that's the real hard part because obviously uh, the one thing that's not like food is uh, my information diet is different than, you know, my sister-in-law Julia's information diet at um, UMass Amherst, right? She has to have a different kind of information diet than I do. Um, 
And so, you know, whereas with food, uh, you and I can basically eat the same thing and it will, it will have roughly the same effects on our body. Like fried chicken, for instance, is bad for both of us, right? Um, but, uh, you know, if you're the communications director of Barack Obama's campaign, that means that you need to watch a lot of Fox News and you need to watch a lot of um, MSNBC. But if you're an ordinary person, I'd say that you don't need to watch a lot of Fox News or MSNBC. Uh, instead, what you probably ought to be watching and listening to is what's happening around you in your local area, in your local neighborhood. I think the principles of the book, um, I mean, the central thesis here is who wants to hear uh, the truth when they can hear that they're right. And we've stepped into this land of abundance now where no matter where you're at, uh, no matter what crazy thought pops into your head, there is a minor media outlet out there willing to tell you that you're right. And you're right. because of that, you can be crazy. <laughs> He's absolutely right, folks. <laughs> um, no, that's a good point. Um, we kind of experience it in reverse in doing our shows on Twit where we'll, we'll make a statement and we'll get lots of people in the chat room we're saying we're wrong for different reasons because <laughs> right. it doesn't fit in but we, to what they uh, think. We're in the chattering class, so we yeah, want yeah. that kind of free-for-all exchange of ideas. But it's, it's, the, same, it's the same principle in reverse, which is, oh, that doesn't confirm my bias, so I'm going to tell you why it's well, wrong. But, but this sounds a little bit like Eli Pariser's filter bubble, where, where uh, because of the nature of, of, of uh, information online, you tend to be in a filter, a bubble, where you only see stuff that agrees with... Uh, what you think, and uh, we've talked about this on Twig with Jeff Jarvis and others, and I agree with Jeff that uh, while that's always been a problem, haven't? I mean, after all, Clay, don't people always do this? Affirm their opinions. Yeah, that is that's exactly right. Um, and part of the problem with the filter bubble, you know, Eli's a Eli's a, a good friend of mine. Um, part of the problem here is that we always seem to be blaming someone else or something else even an inanimate object you know nicholas carr with the shallows right. is is saying like the internet is rewiring our brains and right. it's a sort of uh, um, uh like it, if you compared that to food we'd be saying things like the fried chicken is reanimating itself <laughs> flying out of its bucket and into my mouth it doesn't make any it's sense making me fat it's making right. me fat <laughs> um uh <laughs> It, it, you know, there is some amount of of uh, of of responsibility that the that the reader, the consumer of information, has to take. Just like there's a amount of responsibility that a healthy food diet diet must take in order to stay on a healthy diet. It, it, and, it is and about user choice. And when it comes to things like the filter bubble, um, Eli's book, you know, one thing is if you want to see more, if you're a liberal and you want to see more conservative links in your Facebook feed, there's a real easy answer to that. And that's to click on more links and read more mm -hmm. diverse stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fo follow some people from the other side of the aisle right. at the very and, least. And I guess that's what Jeff always says is, Okay, well, the filter bubble is nothing new. We've always sought people of like-minded, birds of a feather, etc. But, in fact, in this Internet era, we have a much more democratized distributed system of information. You don't have the Rupert Murdochs of the world controlling all information. Much more opportunity. And in just in the course of our day-to-day -day activities online, we are exposed to much more diversity of opinion. So he's of the opinion it's quite the opposite, that, in fact, we are seeing much more than we would have ever seen before. I, I, I think that the the ability for you to select a more diverse information diet certainly exists. Yeah. However, your desire to do it does not, with, not without reading my book, well, in, at least. Humans um, are humans, I understand. I mean, but, but what's funny instance, is Roger Ailes, Roger Ailes from Fox was making the same arguments uh, uh, 30 years ago with Fox News. Um, Roger Ailes said, cable news gives us the ability to make uh, incredible choices now, so we don't have to, you know, uh, we, we can give people a different choice, and that's how Fox News was born. Um, he also said, television news is watched more often than people read, listen to the radio, or get any other form of communication, because people are lazy. This is from your book. People yeah. are lazy with television. You just sit Watch and listen. The thinking is done for you. That was when, that was somebody who was writing for uh, President Nixon. Well, that right. uh, yeah, and that's a that's a really good brings up a really good question that I have, which is, we understand overeating makes you fat, which is bad for your heart, has all these other health implications, 
but why should I care about that? So I, so I, you know, I, I'm getting bad information, or, or what? You, what? You know, I'm, I've got a bad information diet. What are the implications? What, what's the well, downside first off, of it? You know, the average human being uh, in America spends 11 non-working hours consuming information per day. Um, that comes from the UCSD uh, wow. uh, survey on, on – it's called How Much Information. It's striking. That's right? amazing. And you're not talking about seeing a billboard on the side of the road or having a conversation. No, you're talking, talking about, about actively consuming. Right. Well, and you're only awake for 16 hours a day, so right. that's a lot. <laughs> um, the, so when we're doing that, think about this. Uh, are most of the viewers that are watching um, this show right now, are they – uh, on a treadmill? Are they walking around or are they sitting down? Uh, well, people are listening. So it's, so that's interesting because there's a percentage watching live, mm -hmm. but then a lot of people download it. So I would say probably a large number of people who are listening or watching a download are on the treadmill. Yes. They might be jogging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you have the fittest. Probably most, have the, most of them are sitting down. But yeah, there's a, <laughs> we're over indexing. Yeah. Um, uh, you, if, if most of them are standing up and on a treadmill, then I commend you. You have the fittest audience in media. <laughs> we might, actually. <laughs> um, Maybe not. But, uh, but so the first thing is when we're consuming information, generally we're sedentary. And as we know, being sedentary kills you. Um, the second thing, though, is when you begin to get affirmed in your beliefs, constantly affirmed in your beliefs, it makes it more difficult for you to change your mind. So the more people are telling you right, the more difficult it is to hear that you're wrong. And this causes large social problems. So for instance, you have um, a lot less people believing that climate change is happening, uh, even though 100% of scientists now agree that climate change is happening. Uh, and you have a lot of people believing that um, uh, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccinations are uh, the root cause of autism, which it just isn't the case. The guy who came up with that rumor was trying to sell an alternative vaccination so that he could make more money. Um, but somehow we keep listening to Rush Limbaugh, Sarah Palin, and Jenny McCarthy for our science advice, and it's because that's comforting, and it's something that we either want to hear or something that we feel afraid of. So really where I went wrong on Twit is I should have made this a an, a, 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 a network that, this is all Roger Ailes did, that affirms our audience's existing beliefs, that says you're right. Actually, that's what we do. But well, I was going to say, it may be actually what we're doing right in a, in a broader sense, which well, is we're, we're, technology is awesome. We make a mistake, We affirm though, that belief. I think we make a mistake by not being quite cheerleaders as much as we, you're saying that's better to be a cheerleader, Clay, if you want to make money. I'm saying that that's what sells. I think, uh, you know, opinion is a lot cheaper to manufacture and um, a lot more tasty to people than, than fact. Conflict um, makes a better story. That's true. And it's not just, I, you know, I should point out that... Pseudo-conflict, you know, by the way. Well, it doesn't I, matter whether yeah, it's I want to point. Yeah. Well, it does matter. You don't want actual opposing points of view. What you want is a pseudo-conflict that reaffirms the viewer's beliefs. Oh, in the end, right? The I, end. Get what you, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You don't really want uh, an actual debate. Where, so where MSNBC the wrong wants person a... Win, yeah. MSNBC wants two liberals on its show exactly. arguing about how terrible Boehner is, right. and Fox wants two conservatives right. arguing about how you know how terrible Barack Obama is. And you know the thing the thing I want to point out here is that I don't really think that there's a moral judgment to be cast on these large media companies for this. Um, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. Their job is to make the most profitable news corporations in the world and to continue to grow them and to continue to, to make money. Um, and what makes them money is this, is, is affirmation over information. It's very similar to punishing McDonald's for obesity. Right. If McDonald's could figure out how to make broccoli really cheap and taste really good, then broccoli would be served at McDonald's across the country. The problem is, is that broccoli doesn't taste as good as a French fry or a hamburger. So you're saying Unless we're fried. But what you're really saying is we are we are stuck with the news sources that we deserve. That, that well, we yeah. If, if you want to consume, if you want media to get better, the first step starts with you. It's to it's to start consuming better media. Right. And I think there's a, there's a I mean that's the last three chapters of my book are really about that. It's about 
how we can sort of start organizing and uh, make it so that media starts chasing the high-end customer, much like Walmart is now chasing the whole food shopper by reducing the amount of, of salt, fat, and sugar in its, uh, in its food uh, by 20% over the next few years. And they're doing that because they're realizing that they're losing market share to Whole Foods. Now, it took, it took decades for a health movement to, to grab the attention of people uh, w as far as diet goes. And that's something where it, you, you can, at the end, make the argument, if you don't change, you're going to die. Or you're going to suffer. Uh, can you no, make as fact, compelling an argument about information? <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. I can, t I can tell you this. So my Uncle Warren, uh, he's, in the, he's in the book. He's a great guy. I love my Uncle Warren to death. And my uncle Warren is now uh, really sick. He's he. We just found out he has a, a metastasized tumor in his oh, lung. Dear. And four years ago, um, I was on. I guess it wasn't four years. It was 2004. Um, I was on the Dean campaign, feasting on a on Howard Dean's 2004 campaign. You remember that guy, right? Ah! Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Poor Howard just, Dean. It's all anybody will remember. <laughs> he won Iowa. Um, no, he didn't win Iowa. Oh, he didn't. He lost right. Iowa. He ended, ended up losing that's, Iowa. I um, forgot. See, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we were head. feasting on this media diet of all Howard Dean, how great Howard Dean is all the time, and at the same time, my uncle Warren was watching Fox News all the time. Do you want to know what that Thanksgiving is like? Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. Um, and my uncle Warren and I didn't have as great of a relationship after that. And now, like, oh, that's I'm sitting here going, gosh, I didn't get to know my uncle Warren as, as well as I would have liked to in these last, you know, six or eight years. And I think that is, you know, because of a poor information diet on both of our parts. And Well, it's paralyzed. So I, I mean, it's not just paralyzed family relationships at Thanksgiving. It's paralyzed our nation. Yeah, Has that's exactly not? right. And if you, I mean, part of this is... Um, uh, there's an ethical consequence to taking an information diet. And this gets to Eli's uh, filter bubble point as well. Our clicks have consequences, have really strong consequences. You know, your boss might not see you um, reading that Kim Kardashian post, uh, but by you clicking on it and you reading it on the Huffington Post, you're actually you're voting. Making, you're voting for it, right? And that search that you make on Google, you're voting. You're telling an editor somewhere else to write more content about that. Even more and, uh, directly and accurately than we did with television ratings. Yeah, right. right. There, it's really working now. And g guess what? <laughs> you're getting what you deserve. Right. Um, what you and, want. You know, like, that's the, I think the most dangerous special interest in America right now is an American public that is grossly disconnected from the mechanics of power in Washington, yeah. D.C. Like, uh, well, let's, let's talk about SOPA for a second, right? SOPA last week was a, 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 a great victory. We'll herald it as an incredible victory for the Internet. But at the same time, here's some statistics. I, uh, I didn't black out my website, informationdiet.com. Uh, instead, what I did was I held a Better Activism Day. And I started interviewing people from inside Congress to talk to them about how Congress actually moves. And actually I brought a lobbyist in, a high-powered lobbyist in, to talk to him about how uh, he moves Congress and what's the difference between him and a citizen activist. Here's some key things we found out. One, every Senate office only has two people in there to answer the phones, mm -hmm. to read all the emails, mm -hmm. and uh, to read everybody's letters that are mm -hmm. being sent to them. Two people. So... so Wiki so if you do the math there, it basically means that the entire United States Senate can take 96,000 phone calls in a day. Right. How many phone calls do you think Wikipedia can generate in a minute? Oh, yeah. Right. I have no idea, but it certainly could exceed that rate, I would guess. And how do you th – like, they're, the tools that they're using inside of Congress – there, you know, it's basically like Outlook from 1996 right. in order to read e emails. So – no wonder we're so disconnected from power when the tools for listening in our government are so antiquated and the staff that they have in order to do it is insane, is insanely small. Um, and these are the things I wish we'd talk about instead of, you know, uh, Barack Obama's birth certificate, right. right? Let's start talking about how to actually make government more effective at listening to its constituents when its constituents wants to talk to it. You know, there's, these are hard problems for two different reasons. Because one, yes, we like fatty foods and, and, and 
bad, bad stuff. That's the most bad dangerous place in America is between me and a chicken wing. Right. We love that stuff. So partly it's our fault. But I also have to say that uh, there's also a lot of inertia. You talk about scalability in the book in terms of the numbers of uh, m members of uh, numbers of people that each member of Congress represents, which is now what 717,000 people or something. That uh, it that didn't scale well either. And uh, you know the electoral college, another example of a failed system that's never going to change because of the inertia, because of who gains from it, small states. Uh, have un, uh, you know uh, 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 disproportionate power in an electoral college, and so they're never going to allow it to change. And the way it's set up, it can't change. So it isn't just us getting a better information diet, Clay. Uh, we also have a lot of inertia in government, don't we? Sure. Well, sort of. If you take a look at just about every precinct in the country about the number of votes cast for the candidates, it's pretty much always the case that the president gets more votes than the state rep or the city right. councilman. Right. And I think that's a big problem. The first thing we've got to do is sort of flip our, the way that we think about um, uh, our government in terms of priorities. Your state rep or your city council person has much more of an impact on your daily life than the president of the United States of America. So why don't you care more about her or him than you do about the president of the United it's States? It's just like food. We've got to think local. Right. Think local. Huh. I mean, that's a that's – a, uh, we do have a more effective representation in the in the United States, and that's our local governments. We right. have those more. We have the, we have those more uh, representatives. I mean, I started I started um, down the path of politics in 2004 before I worked for Howard Dean. I'd never voted before. Really. Um, but my mom got breast cancer. Her health insurance went from three hundred dollars wow. a month to three thousand dollars a month. Right. And what's a bright-eyed twenty-something supposed to do? Right. I got, I packed my Volkswagen up and drove to Vermont, like any other, you know, uh, 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 college-educated, wealthy white liberal would do. Um, so I find myself up there, and you know, uh, starting Blue State Digital to elect Democrats and doing all this stuff. Uh, my mom, you know, we, my mom still, fortunately enough, she got so old, she, she can, she can, uh, get Medicare now. Um, so, you know, I, but I, that wasn't a victory for me. It probably would have been a better idea for me to focus on, to really solve that problem, to focus on the issues of Georgia and get Georgia to pass some kind of healthcare, uh, reform where, where I'm from, uh, rather than to try and get it passed for the whole country. But this is this is a uh, a problem with the media that we consume, and it doesn't matter whether it's confirming your bias or not. Whenever you see the news, and whenever you hear stories, and even when you hear stand-up comics, they talk about the president. When we talk right. about who well, has an effect, who has the power, it's the president. And so when we think about who can change things, we think about the president because that's all we're ever told about. You never right. see your local representative depicted as someone who can affect any really change true. that affects your life. And again, yeah, that's, that's a little bit on us because we like the horse race. It's easier to understand a two-person sure. horse race sure. than the com you know, complexities of local government. More people watch the Super Bowl than high school sports games too, right? right? I don't want to blame the say, I don't want to blame the media, and I know this is what you're saying, Clay. You can't blame the chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't blame the media because we're getting exactly the media we deserve. Right, right. Well, it's like, like blaming food shows for showing high fat right. content food. That's we're, that's we, stuff we want to watch. What we want. Yeah. Although I've never been able to actually make anything off of a food show. That's the, that's the, you know, one, one big point I have in the, uh, oh, in the, uh, in okay. the information diet is that it's also important to produce information, it's right? What we, to, uh, to, it's what we in the media call an aspirational program. <laughs> it's not something you expect to do. It's something you aspire to It's food do. porn. That's right. It's food porn. That's right. Um, but I think, so public, so think we, we have the ability to publish. Yeah. Should we make media? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I write at least a thousand words a day, um, and it helps me uh, crystallize what I'm thinking about. I wrote this post around SOPA uh, a, a few weeks ago called, someone wrote this post called, uh, Dear Congress, it's not acceptable for you to not know how the internet works anymore. And so I wrote That's this right. response called, Dear Internet, it's not mm. okay for you to not know how Congress works <laughs> anymore. And right? both are true. Both are absolutely true. Both are absolutely true. Um, That's a good and, point. We blame them for their ignorance, but are we not ignorant? Absolutely. Yeah, people are calling their, their member of Congress and asking them to fix potholes. Right. 
member of Congress can't fix what if if a member of Congress tries to fix a pothole, what a member of Congress is going to do is try and get a thirty-four million dollar earmark <laughs> to fix the the state highway system in the in the state that I you're in. That's pothole. all they can do. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, if you want a pothole fix, I'd say either call your city government or learn how to fix potholes. Right. Right. And, right. And go fix a pothole. Right. So how do we, I mean, yeah, we should be paying the most attention to our local aldermen or city council, our mayors, then our representatives, then the presidential race. How, how, but how do we change even that, much less this whole idea of being a, con, going and consuming information that doesn't confirm our biases or doesn't entertain us with conflict? Because I think it's both. I mean, some people watch Fox News not because they agree with it, because they like the spectacle. They, they, it's, it's more fun. I think I think one big important part of this is we have to start teaching critical thinking, right? We have a weird, strange class in high schools now called English, and I'm, I've never I spoke fluent English in high school, um, and while I'm sure that many people didn't, I didn't feel the need to go to an English class in high school to learn English. Well, I, English doesn't teach you how to speak English, right. as most of the people who have trouble speaking English can tell you. They have to go to right. another class to do that. You have to go to another class for that, right? But what English is supposed to do is 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 teach you everything ranging from literature to um, r creative writing. But it really is the the sort of uh, the tenets of, of of critical thinking. I wish we'd we'd start thinking about our English classes like they were critical thinking classes. Um, and I don't think it's just sort of kids that we need to teach critical thinking to. I think adults need to to have a a, a pretty significant refresher on that too. Um, but. When it comes to our media consumption, the first thing that we have to do is build up a, you know, a, a digital literacy. There's something r really strange happening with our economy today, which is people that are digitally literate, people who can, uh, you know, use these information processing machines that we've got all around us, they tend to be doing just fine. Uh, economically. It's people who can't, the digitally illiterate, that are really starting to suffer. And I think that um, that's because we are having a, a massive shift in what I would call the definition of modern literacy. Or modern literacy. Um, and it needs to have a digital component and needs to have a critical thinking component in order for your economic survival. I, you know, it's so, that's a really good point. In fact, I'm going to bring this to the high school um, you know, I'm on the board at the uh, at my kid's high school. This is exact. You know, we talk about critical thinking, but we don't talk about information literacy. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a really, really good point. It's kind of a meta point uh, above and above and beyond looking at something and critically understanding it. Looking at your sources and what you're see actively seeking out as information sources. I, I, I couldn't agree more idea. that teaching critical thinking and the ability to evaluate and think for yourself is. Yeah. Hot, oh, sure. an incredibly important thing. But we're also fighting a trend here where you have a lot of people saying, well, what we need to do is stop wasting time teaching these kids these inval these, these you know, waste courses and teach them vocational training because they don't have the skills to go out and get jobs in this new digital economy. Uh, so how do you reconcile that? Because I've heard well, that I'd argument say, from people who are very smart and would agree with you on everything you've said up till now, but they're like, yeah, but we know what we should do is we should really just train them to work in computers so they can get jobs and stop wasting time with history and English and right. all of that crap. Well, you know, I think teaching someone how to learn is the most important skill that you can teach them. And I think the fl that when you teach someone critical thinking, that's really what you're teaching them is, is how to learn. I'm a self-taught programmer. I had a, a good idea and you know was in college and and had some friends in the computer science department who taught me how to write php and and thank god that they did because you know <laughs> that gave me a, a marketable skill and allowed me to to fail organic chemistry as a marine biology major and be okay with that um and thank god i'm not a marine biologist right now because i well i'd be i guess chasing sea turtles or unemployed you'd be unemployed um, You'd be exactly what you'd be as unemployed. Uh, I know quite a few. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I think, I think to the folks that are like, well, we need to teach people how to work computers. Um, I have a friend who uh, runs this great nonprofit called CodeNow.org uh, who, uh, you know, D.C. has the highest child poverty rate uh, in the nation. And so his wow. the way that he's working on solving that with CodeNow is uh, by t 
teaching kids uh, to create to create a voluntary computer science curriculum for schools. And I think it's really great. It's wonderful. Uh, yeah. uh, he's doing a, his name is Ryan Seashore. He's great. Um, but I think that almost as important as that is teaching the critical thinking components that go with it. It's a nice byproduct that oftentimes uh, the, the effect you get when you start learning how to write code is to sort of think about things dispassionately and logically, which is the key to, I think, critical thinking. Um, but it's not, it's, I think we have to be a little bit more explicit than that. I mean, my wife is, um, my wife is uh, four and a half months pregnant. We just uh, went in and got the uh, uh, yeah, the sonogram, uh, the, our, our, our 20 week sonogram today, which was totally cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sitting here thinking, what what is it that uh, that I need for my kid to learn? I'm looking at things like the Khan Academy, going, man, you know, like can I can I can I start homeschooling my kid? You know, can I? Yeah. Can I, is that is that something that can actually happen? Um, Probably not. I mean, the socialization is still. Uh, Clay, Clay, wait till your kid's a little older. You'll right. see it's completely impractical unless <laughs> unless you don't have to work for a living. And then, right. no problem. Well, if you keep buying my book. <laughs> then, then, Buy this then. book, folks, and Clay's kid will get a good education in five years. <laughs> We're going to take a break. We're talking to Clay Johnson. His new book is called The Information Diet, A Case for Constant Conscious Consumption. It's just out from O'Reilly. I mean, literally just out. <laughs> Smell the hot wet yeah, ink. I finished it in October, so can't get that from an ebook. That's the problem, <laughs> isn't it, with the publishing? You finished it in October. Well, it's still uh, just as germane as uh, as as before, because um, you know what? <laughs> we still are overeating. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about more about this in uh, just a bit. I do want to uh, tell everybody about Ford, our friends at Ford. Uh, talk about a 21st century idea. Uh, the car. It's a great American... Uh, I mean, you, uh, imagine America without the open road, the highway, the, f the freedom, the wind in your hair. And yet, you know, when uh, Henry Ford started Ford, it was something only the very rich could do, and it was his goal. He was to make it something that everybody could do. He's, he literally said, it's my, it's my goal to get every person on the highway. Now, there, <laughs> maybe that was... There's other issues. And now they are. And now they are, and the traffic is terrible. So thanks, Henry. Thanks a lot. No! No! <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah, you made it accessible, you ninny. Uh, <laughs> but no, and, it, and, it's, and it's neat because here we are more than 100 years later, and Ford is still around, and Ford has entered the 21st century uh, as a high-tech company. You know, they were at CES in force with all their cars. And, and the challenge that Ford faces is to bring the car in the 21st century uh, and, and, but use those technologies not to make it more distracting, not to, not to let us be Facebooking while we're, you know, and watching movies while we're driving, but to, in fact to make a car safer, make a car that you can continue to, spend, to put your energy into staying safe, to keeping your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road, and yet still stay uh, connected. It's one of the reasons I love audiobooks, for instance, is I, I, can, I can drive and I can listen. Ford uh, goes way beyond audiobooks. Of course, when I get in the car and I've got sync uh, in my Mustang and my uh, iPhone's got an audiobook, it starts up right where I left off and I... That's what I do in the car. But let's say you want to listen to Pandora or you like podcasts. You want to listen to uh, Stitcher or Slacker Radio. Let's say uh, you want to listen to broadcasts from around the world. Tune in Internet Radio. Um, 50,000 stations. Boy, if I were a radio company these days, I'd be getting on the Internet fast because that is really the future. And all of this without twiddling a dial, without putting in a CD, without looking down at a screen. Your hands are on the wheel, your eyes on the road. Ford Sync and My Ford Touch allow you to control everything with your voice. And with this new app link, which is an API for Sync that lets uh, uh, smartphone developers, Android, iPhone, uh, Windows Phone, to create apps that you can talk to that integrate into Ford Sync. So I mentioned Pandora. That's the, that's the first one that came out. So you completely, you know, you've got Pandora on your phone. Your phone is in the, you know, it's, it's plugged into the USB cable if you want, charging. Um, and you say, you know, play my classic rock station, it starts. Uh, thumbs up if you like a song. Thumbs down if you want to skip it. All of the commands are available to you, but without looking down, without touching anything. Hands on the wheel, eyes on the road. And this is this is the kind of innovation I love. They have open beak. You can read tweets. As I mentioned, Stitcher, Slacker, the new TuneIn Radio. In fact, at CES, I think we saw half a dozen new programs taking advantage of this API, and more will be coming along all the time. Uh, here's the here's the deal. Go to Ford.com/technology. Take a look 
at all the technologies. This is a, these high-tech vehicles, the electric engines, the plug-in hybrids, the hybrids, um, uh, just the, the amazing stuff Ford is doing. Their green plants. You know, it, we were at dinner with uh, the CEO of Ford, Alan Mulally, and um, David Polk said, you know, Alan, I did a piece on for Nova. Uh, we went to Ford, and we talked to a scientist. Ford's using, I, I had no idea, um, uh, renewable resources to build the plastic in their seats. They're you're using uh, plants and um, and like rice. I don't remember what it was, like rice uh, stalks and stuff to make the, the stuffing in the seats and the seats. He says, why don't you talk about that? This, this is amazing. You're doing all the sustainability stuff, and it's just part of their overall plan. When we were there, the roof uh, was covered uh, with... Um, so, some sort of plant that was taking in carbon dioxide, putting out oxygen. It made the building cooler so they didn't have to put so much heat into it uh, in, the, in the winter or, or air conditioning in the summer. It was just really a very interesting uh, outlook on being a car company in the 21st century, truly global. I want you to find out more. Go to Ford.com slash technology. And you know what? If you want to take a look at AppLink, uh, take a look at the 2012 Ford Fiesta. There's one at a Ford dealer near you. Drive one today, and I know you'll like it. Uh, we thank Ford for their support of all of our programs uh, all year long. They are uh, they're just a great company to be a part of, I think. So we're talking about uh, getting on an information. I don't know if diet's the right word, Clay, because it isn't like less information. Uh, neither is a neither is a healthy food diet. I think people who go on diets and uh, go on diets to eat less are are never successful. It's the ones that wow. go on diets to have healthy uh, healthy choices um, and build good habits for themselves. Those are the ones that are successful. Right. You yep. know, the thing is, everybody is on a diet. Right. right? We misuse the word diet. Poor. Diet diet doesn't mean reducing it's calories. Diet means the choices of what you eat. Right. Um, and the point, the point of the information diet is that you have choices there too. I mean, we act as though information, I mean, we're almost trained to feel as though information is something that we don't, that we just react to. If you take a look, you know, I, I st when I was doing this book, I was going, why in the world am I so distracted at this computer? Um, and I was sitting in a room alone, right? So how possibly can I be distracted <laughs> and I noticed that like there's just a symphony of noise going around yeah. uh, around me with like every time I get a new tweet every time there's an email that comes yeah. in every time the you know one of the first steps I talk about in the information diet to start um, uh, getting yourself on the right wavelength is to just start eliminating the notifications and numbers that are beckoning uh, for your attention. There's a reason why you get more notifications, more and more notifications. That's because these companies that are sending you these notifications want your attention they because your, your attention, attention is worth money. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, that's a good point. It's also an exercise program. Did you know this is not from gullible.info? This is true, according, according to Clay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I want to mention gullible.info, too. But did you know that London cabbies have differently shaped hippocampuses than regular people? Did you know that? What is that? What is the effect of that? What does does that it mean? say? Does it say hippocampuses or hippocampi? In it the doesn't book? even and say either. It just says shaped hip have a differently shaped hippocampus. You did it yeah, correctly. I struggled great. with that. I got I got out of trying to yeah, pluralize. You, just, you said I'm not going to pluralize it. I'm going to say a. Man than regular people. And the reason is because the hippocampus is used for moving short-term memory to long-term memory and helps with spatial navigation. And that's what cab drivers in London have to do to get around. Why do you say that? Why do you mention that? Well, because your brain changes based on the information you consume. There's an actual physical effect. Right. You have, uh, it's called neuroplasticity. I mean, a lot of people, uh, it's sort of popular to talk about in the neuroscience field of things. Um, uh, whenever you learn something new, it results in a physiological change in your brain. Sure. Um, and it's not dissimilar from whenever you eat something, it results in a physiological change in your body. Um, this is a, you know, a indicator that your information consumption has effects on you, long-term effects on you that you are not in direct control of. of. Just like your food consumption has long-term effects on you that you are not in control of. Fried chicken probably tastes really good mm -hmm. at the beginning, oh, it does. but over the long term, <laughs> trust me, it does. I, 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 ha oh, ha chicken wings. I know probably about it. <laughs> um, uh, but the long-term effects it has on you are pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. Well, you so know? these beeps and boops actually have a physiological 
reaction in your body. Not just the beeps and boops, but the but the um, sky is falling and the yeah. and the, um, and the here's Kim Kardashian. Here's the news of Kim Kardashian's um, you know latest Marriage. marital yeah. or whatever. Um, well, we were you know we just saw this recently. Um, uh, Google announced a change in privacy policy. We were talking about this on Twig. I'm sure you talked. Yeah, about we talked it. about it on TNT. And uh, the sensationalism that started with the Washington Post just got out of control. And it, the watch it's not because Fox or Washington Post is is somehow trying to you know has an axe to grind or trying to lie to you. They know they'll generate more page views right. by stimulating your whatever the hell cortex, scaring you. In fact, Fox News today. In capital letters, said, "Be afraid," <laughs> and that isn't because they want you to be afraid. It's because they want page views, but they know page views come from that little buzz to the, you know, hypothalamus or whatever. Yeah, there's, it is. A, there's a section in the book of um, Fox News headlines from the AP, or uh, stories that Fox has taken from the AP and repurposed to the the subject line. My favorite one is something like um, Obama polling down amongst working class white women in Iowa got changed to um, Obama has problem with white women on Fox. <laughs> I love it. Technically <laughs> accurate. <laughs> Technically accurate. Um, no, but but not to bash Fox News because I, I think that then that becomes a partisan political debate. Right. It, it, the reason there is Fox News and MSNBC is because uh, Roger Ailes had this insight that if you affirm people's existing beliefs, you'll get better ratings. Fox News trashed CNN, trashed MSNBC. MSNBC immediately responded. Well, it's also because Rupert Murdoch had enough oomph to break the Turner lock on well, cable news. Too. CNN kept everybody out for but a if long Fox time. Could, if Fox could also affirm the beliefs of the left, then they would absolutely do that because they'd make twice as much money. Well, why you can't do both? Oh, at you the can't same do time. both. <laughs> you you can't say that both sides are right all the time. Right. You have to say. I mean, I learned this in politics. In politics, you need to have, um, you need to have uh, your sort of savior, and you need to have your enemy. Right. Mm -hmm. You you can't have one without the other, because um, that's what motivates people. Uh, when I was at Blue State Digital, you know, the amount of time that we spent trying to figure out the perfect subject line so that people, you know, we wrote all those very uh, in interesting and compelling emails that you get from, uh, from, from, you know, your party committees and stuff like that. We spent hours trying to figure out what the right subject line is to get you to click on that. And eventually, you know, we built software to test it, to do a multivariate test so that we could, um, you know, figure out what, the, you know, the absolute best one was See, before is, it went out. The this is why in my gut, I don't want to do SEO mm -hmm. uh, for Twit. I'm just, it makes me very nervous because I don't want to be... Uh, Earning clicks for the wrong reason. I don't want to be tricking people into watching. I'm giving a I'm giving a talk at the Tools of Change conference uh, uh, for O'Reilly in February, uh, and the title of it is "Is SEO Killing America?" Yeah, um, well, for and, this and very it's, reason. It's one of the reasons I have a, such a stupid Twitter name. Uh, which you is, have the worst SEO I have, I have on a, that name. Absolutely worst Twitter name. Uh, which, in case you don't know, it's Ace Detect, and it's not even spelled correctly. It's not even spelled right. But I know that every person that follows me on Twitter meant to follow me, or they're a spam bot that just follows everyone. Do you want to know what Clay's <laughs> Twitter handle is? C-J-O-H. Meet each other. You're both idiots. <laughs> or hey man, my, are my, we? <laughs> my, uh, my Twitter ID is in the, my numeric ID is in the low 3,000s. Uh, oh. And I did it back in the day when, you know, you're primarily interfacing with Twitter on right. on your cell phone. So having oh, a short okay. name was super valuable. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm really interested in getting your thoughts. She's defensive, by the way. That uh, was defensive. I just want to point that out. <laughs> 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 Mine is my full name spelled out. I just want to say. I have that one too, but yeah, I'm just kidding. Anybody can follow that. That's no, too easy. I, I hate SEO. I agree with you. It, don't make it easy. Don't watch, please. Go away. Um, it, it, but this comes from that same notion that to be healthy, it has to be kind of ugly. That if it's too Boring. polished, yeah, if it's too polished, then it's not informationally healthy. That's right. And I think, but I think that's the, the, the case is that we have to really work to get the truth um that you can't you have to be completely uh critical and skeptical with so, the information that you're taking in and deliberate with the information that you're taking right. and rather than we have a passive most people have a passive relationship with media right now and that's really dangerous well i live this every day because on tech news today we our job is to take every 
news story about technology and boil it down into 20 minutes of discussion of what we think are the most important things. And so when we do that, we're not going out. We can't go out and report on all of those things. Right, right. So we have to figure out who to trust and how much. And over the years that I've been doing this kind of show, I've whittled it down to certain sources that I'm like, okay, I can go pretty much on face value when they write it, they've, they're right. There's sources that I can say, they've given me the behind the story story. They've gone beyond that flashy headline and said, here's what's really going on. That's why I went right to Danny Sullivan on Search Engine Lot Watch with that privacy because I knew yep. I would get a better, better. quality analysis yep. from there. And then there's others, uh, like the Register, for instance, where you know they're going to be first, they're going to be fast, but you're going to have to look at it with a skeptical eye. And then there's others I don't even look at at all because I know what I, it's going to pollute my, uh, my opinion and my interpretation. So what are tips for people who aren't in the business of doing this every day to figure out how they can rank those sources and choose the sources that are giving them the better quality information. Well, the first, you know, I call it being an info vegan in the book. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, like it's, it's, it's really funny for a couple of reasons. One is I'm not a vegan. There's no, I'm not we, close I think we to gathered being a vegan. That. Um, but, uh, I, I call it, when I started when I started I used to run a blog called infovegan.com when I was fleshing out the ideas behind this book and uh, vegans would actually um, <laughs> they, they comment and be like I can't believe you you're co-opting veganism you're so <laughs> terrible um, so I made a special point to put uh, info vegan in the book um, and I'm working extra hard to sell it just to to um, to get under the the vegan protester skins but um, <laughs> the the uh, the the idea of info veganism, in a, on a more serious note, I my wife is vegan, so please take my uh, my com vegan lobby. Please take my comments not so seriously. Um, the the veganism is sort of it's a challenge to yourself. It's hard to do. It's it's something that initially um, a lot of people struggle with. Um, info veganism means. Uh, Let's take a look at information as though there's a, uh, a trophic pyramid, right? Um, and in biology, we learned about the trophic pyramid. The sort of further away from the source uh, you get, the less energy you get. Um, so that's why we tend not to eat a lot of secondary consumers. We only eat animals that eat plants. We don't usually eat animals that eat other animals because they're too expensive to produce and they don't give us a lot of energy uh, benefit. Um, so, you know, we eat cows, not lions. Right. Uh, so <laughs> They're easier to chase down. <laughs> they're, they're also, yeah, also they're just easier to chase down. <laughs> yeah. um, but if I, I think if we wanted to factory farm lions, we probably could. Um, so uh, being an info vegan means doing this, the same thing, is to try and, and make your diet stay at the bottom of that trophic pyramid watch, of information. Watch C-SPAN, not MSNBC. Right. It's almost a raw um, food diet. It's like the less processed, the better. But that's right. a lot I, more work. I think that I, it is a lot more wor work, and more importantly, it requires a lot more depth. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem with our information diets is that we involve ourselves with the – with we, we allow ourselves to fool ourselves into thinking that we're experts at things that we're not by reading other people's opinion. And that's really dangerous. Because you can't get the nuance of a subject. You know, when I, I mean, m my career in Washington, D.C. Is, is, is my testimony to this, right? Like, I wanted to get health care to, uh, to elect um, more, uh, or I wanted to get health care from my mom. So my first idea was to uh, elect Howard Dean, president of the United States. That didn't work out. So it was elect more Democrats. I did that. That still didn't work out. So it was shine the light on the lobbyists because it's the lobbyists that are the problem. Turns out that that's not the case either. Um, and every step in this direction, I've gotten a more nuanced view of how politics works and how the mechanics actually happen. Uh, and I'm convinced that the real solution is to instead of sending our message to Washington, D.C., uh, which is important, it's to get the knowledge of how in Washington, D.C. works out of Washington, D.C. so that people can start being more effective advocates uh, for their causes so that so that Congress can effectively listen to them. And to eat lower down on the food chain in the sense that you go to the local representatives. Go right. To your, mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of, to 
to overextend this analogy, it's another thing: is don't eat so high on the food chain. Eat a little right. lower uh, on the food chain. Now well, we know that a plant plant based diet is better for us than a than a meat based diet. Yeah. I mean, but you're not saying you can never rely on an expert. I mean, I'm not going to have to read every court case filing no, to find out what happens in a no. court case. That that that's in inefficient. Fact, you're, I think you're better off if you watch C-SPAN and Fox and MSNBC, and and then you can triangulate. Yeah, try. Good name for a show. We should try. Wow. That. I was doing an interview with uh, with somebody else and, and another journalist, and they said, um, uh, "Well, isn't this going to? If everyone eats low in the food chain, right. then doesn't this put me out of a job?" And I don't think it does. I think that the role for for media is to start showing the work. Uh, and if you can Show be a service work. oriented, Boy, I love uh, that. if you can be a more service oriented journalist and start providing the service to your readers of giving them your source material and saying, this is how I built this story so that they can read yeah. it and form their own minds. I think that's a much more powerful place for journalists mm -hmm. to be. Ars Tactica is very good at that, by the way. They Excellent. link to court cases. They link to Excellent. bills. Yep. They give you a good analysis. But if you do want to, you know, go down lower in the food chain. You always can. I agree. They're the earthy, crunchy tech news source. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. It drives me crazy when I read stories in the New York Times. I've talked with the New York Times about this, about... Um, Link. I'm, Link. I just linked to the bill. Link. And the, the journalists will fire back, and it's not just the New York Times, pretty much anybody that works in print media will say, well, it's too hard in our content management system. Uh, and it's well, like... probably right. Well, but there may be a reason, because uh, there's the, at the higher levels, the feeling that if we send you off the page, you will never right. return. So, right. it, mm -hmm. yeah, it's too hard, and there's a reason it's too hard. And they hard. built it to be hard. <laughs> they don't want you to right. link. Uh, right. That's the beauty of the Internet. All right, we're going we're gonna to wrap up, but I do have to say, by the way, the book, The Information Diet, out from O'Reilly, available now, Clay A. Johnson. Uh, the author, go to a bar near you. Who knows? He might be buying drinks and trying to give you uh, <laughs> books. But the most valuable thing you're going to learn right in here, and this is timely, we're talking about petitions, political petitions on websites, as a, as a co-founder of one of the larger firms on the left responsible for the drafting of these petitions and the software that runs it, I can assure you the online petitions you sign are not meant primarily to cause change. They're meant to get your email address so you can later be bombarded by emails asking for money. What? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <laughs> man. You're what's I mean, wrong. sometimes they work. Look, activism, activism no, works. No, is a good example. Right, yeah. but most of the time, even at whitehouse.gov, they don't really care about that petition. Guess what? <laughs> I know because I get those emails, lots of them. <laughs> I even get text messages. Yeah, Barack Obama I get a text, text messages me. Yeah, lot. I found out it was Michelle's birthday the other day. They texted me, "Help celebrate Michelle Obama's birthday." I still get Send emails from John McCain. Do you? Yeah, Did you sign up for his time. too? Oh yeah, that's nice of you. Very, There's a, I have a service uh, that, I, that I monitor all the political emails with, and uh, it's actually in the book. There's a screenshot of the sort of services, that the emails that come to Republicans versus the emails that come to Democrats, and it's absolutely insane what, what people's email diets for political information are. You point out if you sign up for Newt Gingrich's email, it's not long before you start getting offers to buy gold, penny stock. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Why am I not surprised? I am not. If you listen to Rush Limbaugh, you get the same ads. What is it about gold? I don't understand. Anyway, um, this is a very readable, fun book full of interesting facts. It will take you 267 minutes. Yes. It's a quick book. It's 150 pages. Uh, but but you know what? It's a great – it's a read that you could uh, uh, just quickly go through. And, and yet it's full of really great insights and facts and ideas, and I love it. Um, and uh, we didn't. <laughs> I wanted to mention gullible.info because I'm having so much if fun. You, if you re try to read this in, in a day, though, you'll only be able to take in 26% more of your daily recommended intake. So <laughs> you you might did it over two it days, out. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, gullible.info was started by a George Washington University student who decided that you could make up facts that were so credible that people would believe them. And there are now many of these facts in Wikipedia. He actually spends a lot of time looking for his fake facts. And that you get just go to gullible.info. It's it's good for. Have you ever seen? I've never seen this site. It's so funny. I hadn't seen it until I saw it in the book. The yeah. sale of one percent milk has declined nearly twenty six percent since the beginning of the Occupy they Wall sound Street protest. So believable. <laughs> <laughs> the title of the lyric of the old English carol "God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen" was originally a sexual innuendo. But what's I mean, what's really dangerous here is one of those facts was Timothy Leary invented or discovered a fourth primary color called Glendale. And that got cited in Wikipedia. Um, and then someone uh, from The Guardian 
uh, used Wikipedia in a story about, yep. uh, uh, and Glendale shows up in the Guardian. Well, right? what it really That's, what it really tells you is to suspect all facts, because right. this process, whether created intentionally by this guy or just accidentally by journalists, there's no there's no canonical truth. It's all BS. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you should eat lower on the f information food chain. Go to the go to the okay. original sources. Only talk to people. Every historian knows that. You read the original materials as much as possible. Materials. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Really good. I'm so glad to talk to you, Clay, and I admire so much what you've done, uh, especially with the Sunlight Foundation. I just think uh, you're you're just uh, an inspiration. Gina Trapani says I've decided to be much more selective about what information I feed my head. Baratunde Thurston says 80% of Americans suffer from information obesity. That's not true, but it could be. It's time we got on a healthier information diet. Um, this is a wonderful book. Tim O'Reilly said, this book convinced me I was eating too many mental calories. And if Jeff Tim O'Reilly's overeating, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Jeff Jarvis is listed as yeah. further reading. So is yeah. Julian Sanchez. Many of, the, many of the people we love most. Thank you so much, uh, Clay, for being on the show. And uh, It's a pleasure. Come back. Soon, I'd love to talk to Any you. Anytime. Where are you located? Anytime. I'm here in Washington D.C. But okay. um, got to get know. out of the Beltway, dude. Come over here to California. Come, come to Washington. Let me show you the ropes. Actually, I'd love to. You know what? I might take you up That's on that. That's a great idea. I would yeah. take you up on that. We do have a lot of chicken in Petaluma, though. Just yeah. So. Ooh, fried chicken. <laughs> Thanks, Clay. Congratulations Thanks much, on, your, uh, on your on uh, your impending uh, fatherhood. I get a yeah, baby and a book this year. It's uh, it's wow. going to be the biggest year of my life. So uh, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, if this writing gig works, it'll make it's good for being a parent. Then you could do the homeschooling <laughs> and all that stuff. Yeah, you can write the textbooks. Yeah, <laughs> Clay Johnson. Thank you, Clay. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you all for joining us. We do triangulation every Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time on Twitter. It's fun to watch live because you can be in the chat room. And I watch the chat room and. Uh, and and it's always fun. it's always a laugh, and uh, we often include the chat room uh, questions and comments. So please, uh, if you can, be here uh, four to five p.m. Uh, on Wednesdays Pacific. And uh, if not, don't worry. Every episode is always available online at twit.tv. Uh, Thirty-eight episodes now uh, up there, and uh, you can download them all. Listen if you prefer to exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, watch if you prefer to vegetate. It's up to you. We don't judge. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Triangulation.